The history of ideas in radio fascinates me. Ideas shape how we think, how we understand and how we do things. Ideas can be changed by the progress of knowledge, major events and personal experiences. For example, in the early days of radio, people believed in this thing called the ether, which was thought to carry radio signals. That idea fell by the wayside when radio propagation became better understood. Spark transmitters and crystal sets in the early low frequency days were simple things built on timber breadboards. Stiff wires with beautifully formed corners connected the parts. The same construction continued when tubes replaced crystal detectors in the 1920s. The big change happened when receivers went from battery to AC power. Voltages rose, hum became a problem. Shielding became essential, especially with higher gain superhead circuitry. And stray inductance and capacitance from long leads on breadboards degraded performance, especially on higher frequencies. Production had to be faster to make radio affordable to more people. Manufacturers changed to metal chassis with direct connections underneath. So did the more progressive amateurs, encouraged by the ARRL's Ross Hull. Though it was the Great Depression. The ham, with little money, probably still built their two-tube transmitter on an exposed breadboard made from packing crates or tea chests. The times encouraged expediency over safety. Receivers were made without power transformers to drive down costs. As late as the 1960s, a famous Popular Mechanics article described a sausage cooker project made by passing AC mains voltage through sausages. And the English having to wire their own plugs is a recent memory. For amateurs though, one event changed everything when it came to electrical safety. The death of Ross Hull in 1938, 80 years ago. Ross Hull was an Australian-American amateur pioneer. He was active in the early Trans-Pacific HF tests and pioneered UHF communications. Hull was recruited by the ARRL to run their lab and edit QST. But not for long. His promising career was cut short in 1938. Hull was electrocuted when he put his hand across 6,000 volts when experimenting with television apparatus. He was 36. The death sent shockwaves through the amateur fraternity. Every old timer worthy of name knows the story of Ross Hull. More importantly, the lessons taught. That badly contained electricity spares no one not even the best and brightest. The ARRL and QST began a safety campaign. Safer design and construction practices were encouraged. For example, earthing, switching, fusing, shielding and insulation. 1920s open breadboards and depression era transformerless designs were discouraged. Radio leagues and magazine publishers felt a sense of duty to their members and creators. For the most part, editors refused publication of projects thought to be unsafe. If something slipped past, you can be sure there would be critical letters in the next issue. This is self-regulation by informed amateurs at work. Amateurs still got electrocuted or fell from towers, but overall the hobby probably got safer. Just as awareness of the horror of war falls with the departure of those with first-hand experience, the same is also true of electrical safety amongst amateurs. Solid-state circuitry reduced the number of us with high-voltage experience. People still build transmitters, but mostly low-voltage QRP. Fewer run external amplifiers. 
And how long ago did your favourite amateur magazine feature a high voltage project? Even if you didn't build it, you probably saw warnings about the hazards involved or learnt about construction practice. Articles today are as likely to be on a website or video as in a magazine. That's great in that there's instant publication and audience feedback. But there is seldom technical editing. So you're just relying on one person's unverified word. Viewer and reader beware. Nostalgia is another factor. Perhaps I'm drawing a long bow, but hear me out. Nostalgia at its best ranges from funny tales of past embarrassments to a contemplation of history's lessons. Amateur radio is richer for these stories. And we can be thankful to those who share their recollections on video. But there's also bad or junk nostalgia. People with chips on their shoulders may take refuge in a rose-coloured version of history that never really happened. In technical fields, junk nostalgia can become an atavistic, anti-intellectual cult whose followers let 50 years of knowledge slide from memory. Which seems odd, given the effort they probably spent learning when younger. Good and bad nostalgia can influence the projects we build. Junk nostalgia in projects are those so bad that they are better left unbuilt. For instance, crude depression era transmitters built on scraps of wood, complete with exposed high voltage connections. Such contraptions are nostalgia's potentially dangerous face. It's as if Ross Hull, who advocated better construction practices, had lived and died in vain. Why would you not at least build something of good design from the 50s, with parts safely behind a front panel on a properly earthed metal chassis? Speaking of which, I trust that your supply earthing is intact and not sacrificed to the false god of hum prevention expediency. Part of the reason is that high voltage timber chassis junk nostalgia projects are being promoted by those who'd, I'd hope, would know better. Maybe they do indeed know better. A pine board project might be safe in their hands. For instance, they are perfect radio amateurs. So perfect that if they have children or grandchildren, they never visit. Their shack is always locked. They never operate equipment when tired, and they wear insulated gloves at all times. One hand is always behind their back. Capacitors are always discharged. They never accidentally bump something. Equipment is never left on unattended. They are never ever careless or suffer memory lapses. And they never trip over a cord that could send a project crashing. The list could go on, but their audience may not be as perfect as them. Remember what I said about today's ham having less experience of high voltages than those 60 years ago. Good defensive design for electrical safety assumes Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. It assumes the user is fallible, that is, they are human. Not just you, but people around you and any future owners of the equipment. How do you know this? It might be possible if you're giving a live talk where your audience is close and known. But it cannot be the case for a web article or video. Here, your audience is distant and unknown. They may be anyone from the unqualified to the highly experienced. So, a degree of prudence is called for when it comes to projects being described. My personal view is that high voltage open pine board transmitters and the like should not be described as practical projects to an unknown audience. At best, they are a historical curiosity, the product of an era when enthusiasm was high and money was low.
Things have changed and the financial pressure to cut corners ceased long ago. Sure, build a solid state rig on an open board, but if you wish to recreate high voltage tube gear, why not go for power transformer based designs from the 1940s, 50s or 60s? Gear then typically used safer metal cabinets and was more refined and its performance is likely to make it still practical to use on the air today.